Kamala Harris, Donald Trump, and Brett Favre. Why Wisconsin is in the spotlight tonight, and how the White House tried to clean up after the president. That's Topping the Hill on News Nation tonight. You are not subhuman. And we know it's what they believe because look how they've treated you. They've treated you like garbage. Let me be clear. I strongly disagree with any criticism of people based on race or gender. I vote for. All right. So both Donald Trump, Vice President Harris reacting today after President Biden stole the show last night with his comments that suggested Trump supporters are garbage. But the White House says not so. He was not calling Trump supporters garbage. Hello, good evening. Welcome to Washington. I'm Blake Berman. Consider this, though. More than 57 million voters have already cast their ballots all across this country and in the key swing state of Pennsylvania. A new poll out tonight shows only 1% have yet to make up their minds. Translation, America knows who it's voting for. We just have to wait six more days to find out. Vice President Harris already in Pennsylvania and North Carolina today. Trump in the Tar Heel State as well. Both set to take to the stage in Wisconsin this evening. And that is what the final sprint looks like. We begin tonight with our Libby Dean, who is traveling, traveling alongside the former president. Libby? Blake, all anyone here outside and now inside can talk about is these garbage comments from President Biden that we heard last night. Trump himself has already acknowledged it. He acknowledged it last night, seizing the opportunity to highlight it and then doing it again today in North Carolina where he was campaigning. So I wouldn't expect anything less here during his comments or his remarks here in Wisconsin. Now, this is something that Trump supporters are actually leaning into. When I speak to people here on the ground, someone even told me that they're hoping that the Trump campaign makes shirts that say, uh, we're garbage, and that uh, they're hoping the Trump campaign continues to fundraise off of these comments and Republicans continue uh, to highlight these. But this is kind of a double-edged sword because Trump is trying to recover and his campaign is trying to recover from those Madison Square Garden remarks where we saw t- uh, comedian Tony Hinchcliffe make a joke, a uh, distasteful joke about Puerto Rico being a, quote, floating island of garbage, and they are playing cleanup from that, uh, distancing themselves from Tony Hinchcliffe, Trump himself distancing himself uh, from him. But as for the state of the race here in Wisconsin, as you mentioned, Harris here also. But the reason that Trump is here is not only to win over voters, but also to encourage people to get out and vote here in Wisconsin. And he's doing so by bringing out Brett Favre, no doubt a controversial figure right now because of uh, the welfare uh, cases that we're seeing surrounding him. But Brett Favre actually was just on the stage here, just wrapped up. And he also addressed those uh, garbage comments from Biden, uh, directly addressing it as every pre program speaker has. And we expect Trump to do so as well. Blake. All right, Libby Dean, live for us tonight in Wisconsin. Libby, thank you. So Republicans today won a lawsuit in the key state of Pennsylvania in the blue area of Bucks County. It essentially lengthens the early voting period after concerns when some voters encountered long lines. A legal win for the Republican National Committee and its chairman, Michael Watley, joins us live once again here on the Hill. Michael, thanks for being with us tonight. It's good to be with you, sir. Yep, you got it. Free and fair election. Are we seeing it right now? 57 million Americans have voted all across this country. Any concerns? Yeah, look, what we see right now, we really like from from every aspect in terms of our metrics, looking at uh, the early vote numbers, looking at the absentee vote numbers. uh, The voter registration numbers feel very, very strong right now. I think in uh, a number of states, Donald Trump is going to have an outright lead uh, going into Election Day, a number of states where he's going to be doing dramatically better than he did in 2016 and 2020. Uh, We were very happy in Pennsylvania uh, that the court sided with us in saying that Bucks County was violating Pennsylvania law in not allowing uh, these voters who were in line uh, to be able to cast their ballots uh, you know, pursuant to the to the state process there uh, and is going to have Bucks County open for, you know, a few extra days free and, to allow free people and to fair, get in. Though, free and fair election, yeah, though, Michael, as you're seeing it? Right so now, why is Donald Trump it, then we, making we the... Good. Okay, so why is Donald Trump then making the, the case, quote, Pennsylvania is cheating? Do you have well, any evidence think, that there is uh, cheating? Well, I think that uh, what we saw was those election officials 
uh, were acting inappropriately and not allowing people that were in line to vote uh, had the opportunity to ca and cast those ballots. So if you got that resolved, then, then is there no cheating, I guess, in Pennsylvania? Well, what I'm going to say is we are going to continue to be very aggressive in our monitoring and our engagement with uh, the voters across uh, Pennsylvania and every other battleground state, along with elections officials, uh, legislators. And if we need to go to the courts, then we will go to the courts. What we want to make sure is that we're going to have a fair, accurate, secure and transparent election cycle. Should, should that be his message, though, I guess, Michael? Well, I certainly a message that we're going to continue to to put out there is that we are watching and we are working very aggressively to ensure that we're going to have fair, accurate, secure and transparent elections. OK, let, let me let me move on here. Um, you, you think you're in a good spot, if I hear you correctly. New Quinnipiac University poll out in Pennsylvania today shows only one percent are undecided in that key state. Do you believe there's actually any persuadable voters out there at this point or is it simply turnout? Well, I think it's a combination of the two. There are obviously some voters who have not made up their mind, and there are some that are not necessarily hard commits, uh, even if they're telling a pollster that they're on one side or the other. That may be soft support uh, that we need to go out there and we need to, to have conversations with. Um, but there is a huge turnout uh, that we want to make sure that we're going to be able to drive uh, because there is a set percentage of the population that's going to vote Democrat no matter what, uh, that's going to vote Republican no matter what. We need to make sure that we get those people up and out. A huge focus of ours has been going after low propensity voters. These are people who we know will vote for Donald Trump, will vote for Dave McCormick in Pennsylvania or other Senate Republicans or House Republicans across the country. Um, but we've got to get them off the couch. We've got to make sure that we get them to go in and turn out the votes. So six days to go. Uh, Nikki Haley, of course, uh, one time served in the Trump administration, ran against the former president this go around. Here's what she said um, just last night. I'll get your reaction on the other side. Women will vote. They care about how they're being talked to and they care about the issues. They need to remember that this is a time of discipline and this is a time of addition. A time of addition, a time of discipline. You know the numbers, Michael, but for our audience here on News Nation or listening to us on Sirius XM, there is a gender gap in this election. And for Donald Trump, for example, in the last New York Times poll, it was minus 12 with women. The, the Quinnipiac poll I referenced today in Pennsylvania was even wider than that. Why isn't Nikki Haley out on the trail for you, for Donald Trump right now? And if she isn't, well, is that going to change anytime soon? Well, look, we certainly welcome uh, Nikki Haley and her support and uh, appreciate the fact that she is out there messaging right now. Uh, and she is talking about the issues that women voters, but every voter really truly cares about. Uh, people care about inflation. They care about grocery prices, gasoline prices, housing prices, and whether or not their, sa their communities are safe. So these are issue sets that, that everybody is out. And, and we welcome Nikki Haley being out there and, and supporting President Trump. I, I hear you on the support, but not having her out there on the on the trail, Michael, with with six days to go in an election in which, I mean, my gosh, could could move a few thousand votes one way or the next. Shouldn't she be out there for for Donald Trump at this point? And, and, and why isn't she? I you know, you'd have to take that up with her. Like I said, at this point in time, we certainly welcome her support, uh, like we welcome the support of Tulsi Gabbard, of Elon Musk of uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and uh, Republicans across the spectrum. Uh, everybody is out there right now. Uh, they are working very, very hard in all of these battleground states and every state across the country. The Republican Party is more unified than we have been in generations. And uh, that's one of the main reasons that we're in a really strong position where we're leading in the national polls, we're leading in every battleground state, and we're leading in every issue poll uh, is because we do have that united front and we're pressing forward. Let me leave you with this. Trump in Virginia and New Mexico in the upcoming days states he lost by 10 and 5 and 10 and 8. Why is, what is the decision there and the thinking there, Michael, to, to send him into states that are solid blue states? 
Donald Trump is playing offense. Right now, uh, we are seeing numbers. We are seeing indicators that, that show us that those states may be in play. Uh, what we're seeing right now in the battleground states is Donald Trump continuing to have small but durable leads. Uh, we feel that uh, we're in a great position, given the early votes and the absentee votes, uh, for him to expect that we're going to go into Election Day with a great opportunity uh, to win this thing. But Kamala Harris is playing defense right now. Uh, she is playing so, defense in terms of her messaging. She's playing defense in terms of her polling. Uh, she is, is playing defense really in terms of having to withdraw resources from states like North Carolina and have to reallocate that. Uh, so right now, uh, Donald Trump playing offense and these states are, are good indicators of it. I said, I said I'd leave you with that, but one more. Give me a time. When do you think we know the winner? I think we're going to know on election night that Donald J. Trump is going to be our 47th president. Michael Watley, chair of the RNC, always appreciate your time, sir. Thanks once again for being with us here on the Hill. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, sir. All right, you got it. Meantime, President Biden and the White House are continuing to do damage control today after, after the president made this comment last night here in Washington. They're good, decent, honorable people. The only garbage I see floating out there is his supporters. His, his, his demonization of seen as unconscionable. Now, the president and the White House insist that he was not referring to Donald Trump supporters as garbage. So could this cause damage for Vice President Harris and how effective her attempts are to separate herself from the current president? Joining me now, Chris Steyerwalt, host of The Hill Sunday, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and Kelly Meyer, News Nation, Washington correspondent. Hello to you all. Hello. Happy uh, Six Wednesday. Days. Six days left to go. Yeah. Um, that in part, Chris, last night is why Joe Biden is no longer the Democratic nominee for president. When I saw that, that was sort of my first reaction, one of them. That's why he's no longer the nominee. They tried to clean it up today, did they? Well, I mean, this is the most uh, famous apostrophe now in, yeah. in American political history. Where, where was the president's apostrophe and when did he know it was missing? Um, <laughs> Look, it's 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 a it's a very thin story to try to claim. Oh well, because you listen to it now. Of course, Joe Biden never made much sense. Well, frequently didn't make much sense before he was mm -hmm. elderly. But now, obviously, this no, no one has to wonder why Kamala Harris didn't want Joe Biden out on right. the campaign trail with her. Now, the other question is this: Who's the voter that previously was not going to vote for Donald Trump? Heard this and said, "I'm in." Mm -hmm. Who does this bring into the electorate? I'm not saying that there's nobody, and as you alluded to with Chairman Watley, if we're going to spend, if you and me are going to get to spend Christmas time in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, oh, gosh. waiting for the Pennsylvania okay. Supreme Court to render decisions right. on a handful of ballots, if we're doing Florida 2000, but we're going to do it in Pennsylvania, then yes, every little thing might make a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, Kelly, I remember earlier this summer coming out of the White House, uh, they said it's, it's all a cheap, the, the videos with Biden, they were cheap fakes, headline in the Hill. Cheap fake Biden videos burst in the national spotlight, and then we saw Biden in the debate. And after the White House took the position it did this summer with the president, how do they have any credibility left with that their defense today? I mean, and you saw everybody, you know, really seizing on these remarks last night. And as Chris was saying, you know, we saw it for ourselves. The people watching, voters at home saw the video for themselves. So they really had to just kind of step in there and say he didn't mean what he said. And that's what we heard from the White House today, that that wasn't what he meant. He doesn't think that the former president's supporters are garbage. And that's why he insisted to put out the tweet last night from the president, uh, making sure that it wasn't, as they said, taken out of context. But it's definitely damage control down at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And this is something that potentially could impact, as you said, the vice president in the final six days. And we are we do know that the campaign has said there's nothing on the schedule for a joint appearance with the two of them, at least until yeah. Election Day. Nope, not going to happen. Kelly, thank you. See you later in the show. Chris, stand by. Still to come here on the Hill, only six days left as the vice president and former president battle it out in the key swing states. Steyerwald joins us to break down why there is a shift in some of those states. And what we've been seeing. I've got it right here. The numbers. We've got the primo stuff right here. We're back in force. Stay with us. A live News Nation special. It's time to have your final say on this year's race for the White House. Join Cuomo, O'Reilly, Rivera, Smith, plus Cuban, White, Halen, and Kennedy. Tonight, only on News Nation. 
All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. It's Vice President Harris and Donald Trump stump in the battleground states today. The polls in those swing states continue to basically show a dead heat. The race has been remarkably stable in the last couple months or so, but month or so, really. But there has been a bit of movement as well. Styrol, looking into the numbers, breaking it all down. Chris? Okay, <clears throat> let's start with what we know. Element number one, mm-hmm. our first beautiful graphic here on the big board. So here is your average in the Decision Desk HQ polling average nationally, October 2nd, one month, one month ago from today okay. compared to today. Yep. What do you see? Trump up one, Harris down 1.6. Mm-hmm. Why is that? We could talk about why. We could talk about did he get a point from her? Did a point of undecided come in? It's all very interesting. We'll find <laughs> out in six days. But I want you to look at the second Beautiful graphic on the big board. Number two, here you go. How about Pennsylvania? Hmm. How about Pennsylvania? How does this compare to that? She's down less in Pennsylvania now than she is nationally, hmm. and he's up about the same. He's right. gained about the same. Maybe, maybe he's, he was getting those people who were sideline sitters. Maybe huh. he was getting those people who were sideline okay. sitters. But maybe it's not statistically significant. Why don't we look at Georgia, which is his Pennsylvania, Donald Trump's Pennsylvania, is where's she basically the same thing and he's come in big again it tells us it points us to the idea that what happened in october was that people who were undecided were really republicans who were just it took them this last little bitsy bit huh. to come in and and join the party uh that they were going to be part of anyway what about michigan what about michigan good question how about number four show us beautiful number four here's michigan hmm. what do you see Tighter ah, margins. It's very tight in Michigan. Yep. It's very tight in Michigan. And last but not least of the swing states, number five, Arizona. Why don't we take a look here? Oh, no, this is the average. This is all of them together. You take them all together. What's the story that you see? Now I want you to compare the story that you see here. This is the average of all the swing states taken together. I want you to, com- I want you to contrast that with the national. Okay. And if you look at this, and I think... So, and maybe I'm going to be annoying and ask you to toggle back and forth. But look at this, down 1.6 plus 1. Now go back to the swing state average. Go back to number 5. The verdict here is it's tighter in the swing states Hmm. than it was nationally. And the movement in the polls that we saw nationally, we haven't seen in the same way in the swing states. Hmm. Why? Is it because people are getting bombarded with ads and that they, they knew these things earlier and have been affected by these things more? But that's the kind of sassafras that we'll be looking for <laughs> on election night. Uh, real quick, so the quote-unquote persuadables, were, they were Trump, yeah. who ended up coming back home? The story of this election in a lot of ways is that the Republican Party has been more unified behind Donald Trump in this cycle than they have at any time in the past. We saw that in the primary. We saw it in the primary, and that Donald Trump started from a higher place. And we didn't have to go through the whole kabuki dance that we did in 2016 and 2020, where Republicans said, ah, gee, Willikers, I don't know if I'm going to support Donald Trump. They all almost all ended up supporting Donald Trump. Now the Republicans who are against Trump are against him, and the ones that are for him have been for him for a long time. That's why the polls have been stable, stable, stable. Now we just have to wait and see. Here's the thing. Okay. What's the thing? We don't know who's voting. Right. right? That's right. We don't know. So we, at the American Enterprise Institute, today we had a great pollster panel, talked to two of the best pollsters in the business, one Republican, one Democrat. They'll tell you. They have a guess about what the electorate's going to look like, but we don't really know. It's, this is a big deal because we, after 2020, there's a lot of uncertainty in who's really in this electorate right. for 2024. It's still the shoulder shrug emoji. Yeah. yeah. We'll see. Get a hunch and bet a bunch. Um, you're going to get great transparency here. Election night, Chris, uh, DDHQ. I-, I want you real quick to walk the viewers behind. As the numbers come in and you start to look at them, and Scott Trainer and DDHQ start to look at them, what we're going to be doing here on News Nation. I'm personally victimized by this because <laughs> right. for a long time, what I loved to do was be part of calling races and be part of the team mm-hmm. calling races. But instead, I'll be sitting over at that desk annoying the team okay, there from you go. DDHQ. That's an upgrade. Huh? As, as, no, it's not an upgrade. I, I, the Nerdquarium is where I belong, right. but I'm going to be doing this. And part of the, the idea here is the promise of News Nation, if it is news for all Americans, yep. 
what people want on election night is fast, accurate calls. Mm-hmm. We're going to do it fast, and it's going to be accurate. We're, that's our aim, and we don't need to kiss anybody's patootie and make yep. them feel better about it. We can do, treat them like grown-ups and tell them what the news is, and we're going to be transparent about it, and we've got a great team at DDHQ. Indeed, indeed. Great team there. Steyerwald here as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, just six days away from the biggest night in politics, don't you know? Here is where the presidential race stands, according to the polling averages from DDHQ. As part of our election night coverage, News Nation is partnering with, as I mentioned, DDHQ to bring you the data-driven results in real time. Do we have the average? I don't know. It was there. I saw it. Oh, was it there? I totally had it. It's very close. It looked beautiful. Uh, Within a point or so. They got, I think, 54% chance of Trump winning. Yeah, it's close. Anyways, uh, by the way, our coverage here on News Nation. Be sure to follow America's decision next Tuesday with our best in the business political analysts, uh, only here on News Nation, 6 o'clock Eastern, 5 o'clock Central, and starting yeah. next Monday. Yeah, I'm going to get up early for you, Set brother. the alarm clock, brother. Uh, I'll join Marky Martin to co-host Morning in America, 6 a.m. We will also have an early start Wednesday right here after the election. I'm doing double duty next week, my man. Berman means business. Here even on in the, the morning, Hill. And even at 5 a.m. Get some sleep this weekend. Coming up here on the Hill, it is not just the White House up for grabs next week. What about the House and the Senate? Equally as important. Brian Enton is now across the country on his road trip. Uh, Brian, where are you today? Listen, you're going to be doing double duty, Blake. You try driving across the country and then you get back to me. Uh, I'm going to reveal a beautiful view to you in a second. Hints of where we are, home of the blue jeans, home of the wetsuit, home of the Cobb salad. This is one of the states that is the reason the U.S. House is red. And this big cable should be a good hint. This big cable is part of one of the big sites here. We'll be right back. Hinton out west, other side of the break. All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. Six days to go as election week heats up. We find both candidates in the state of Wisconsin this evening. Former President Trump's rally in Green Bay with Brett Favre. And more than 100 miles southwest, or right around the corner, really, uh, Vice President Harris is in Madison. And that's where we find our Mills Hayes reporting live for us tonight in Wisconsin. Mills? Hey, Blake. Well, you're in uh, Madison. This is home to almost 50,000 college students, and Dane County is pretty reliably blue. Back in 2020, Biden won the county by 70, more than 76 percent. So the Harris Walls campaign sees this as key to uh, their path to victory. Now, here in Wisconsin, it is notoriously close in presidential elections. Let me show you guys what the polling looks like right now. Our Decision Desk HQ shows that, that Trump is actually leading by about point. Six percent, and this is something that we've seen pretty much across the country as far as Trump leading. But the Harris campaign says they are all in now. Tonight, there's going to be a concert that is going to feature performances from Remy Wolf, Gracie Abrams, Mumford and Sons, and people from the Nationals. So some of those groups really target the Gen Z millennials. We've spoken to some college students that are out here. This is their first time voting, so a lot of them are very fired up to be voting for Harris. And they see this really as key because they need Dane County in order to, hopefully, they want to win the state. Now, also, too, I want to add about Haley voters. Back in April, during the Republican presidential primary, Nikki Haley, when she had dropped out, she still had over 76,000 votes. So if Harris can uh, get any of those voters, she could uh, see a pathway to win the state. Blake? Mills Hayes, live for us in Wisconsin tonight. Mills, thank you. Now the race for the White House. Not the only one we're going to be watching. Republicans right now control the House by a slim majority, and the balance of power could shift in just a matter of days. Right now, Republicans barely control the House with 220 seats to the Democrats' 212. So that's where it is right now. There are three vacant seats, one Republican, two Democrats. All right, now, according to the uh, Decision Desk HQ... Control of the House is basically a toss-up right now. Republicans with a 54% chance of winning. And their prediction right now, would you look at this? Their prediction, six days to go, is 219 to 216, meaning coin flip type stuff can go in any direction. According to the Cook Political Report, by the way, there are 25 races considered toss-ups. California is right in the middle of it all. All right, so I want to show you right now what's going on in the Golden State uh, in in California right now. So 52 seats in Congress, and that's why we're paying uh, a big, big deal to California. 40 Democrats, 
11 Republicans, the one vacant was a Democratic seat. Um, let me show you two races in particular. I want to take you to CA 13. So this is the congressional district uh, right now of John Duarte. And look at this. This is one of these races that's being watched. He won by less than 1,000 votes back in 2022, the Republican. This is one of those uh, races that, 25 of them, that we're going to be watching on election night. Let me take you over uh, to the 27th district there in California. Mike Garcia, you notice it's much different. He won last go-around by six and a half points, but this is considered a toss-up. So you had a race that was uh, by 1,000 votes, another race by six and a half percent, and this is why so many folks are watching California. Yes, we talk about the seven key swing states, but watching California. And that is why our Brian Enton is there this evening. All right, Brian, you've gone across the country all the way out west tonight. What'd you find? Can't believe we made it. We started with you in New Jersey, and here we are on the west coast uh, in California. I think the only thing really read around here, uh, for the most part, is this, the Golden Gate Bridge. What a view. It's just beautiful over here, Blake. Uh, But it is interesting when you look at the specifics in California. They have flipped uh, four house seats red since 2020. Uh, And when we went out and started talking to people, there was one group that was particularly interesting politically here. Take a look. There's a special kind of energy here in San Francisco's Chinatown that's contagious. They're hosting a monthly market that's quickly becoming a new tradition in the making. I hope you like my cartoon. Ellen Lee Zhao, hoping she can break a long-standing tradition in the Democrat-dominant city by being elected San Francisco's mayor as a Republican. I've been in San Francisco for 38 years. I don't want government to keep giving me all those problems. While Zhao's candidacy is a long shot, the grand old party is making inroads with the area's Asian community. Not far from Interstate 80, Eva Zhao is raising her family in Sacramento County. You ready for your lesson? Yeah. <laughs> she says after coming from China legally as a university student, the current state of immigration is frustrating. Immediately they get the work permit, they get driver's license, maybe housing, right? That seems to me as punishing us who follow the rules. Zhao's summer day is spent making sure youngest daughter Joycelyn excels in her third language, Mandarin. Hi, Tian Motherhood, home ownership, and cultural values soured her on the Democratic Party. A lot of the older immigrants they uh, really were in, involved with the Democratic Party. So when the ballot came, they saw an Asian name. They said, hmm, this is like one of us. Let's vote for him. I say there's a group of Chinese or the Asian community started wake, uh, waking up. We're a single-digit party. Uh, we're outnumbered nearly eight to one by the, by the Democrats. Head of the San Francisco GOP, John Dennis, is casting a wide net to change that. Statewide over the summer months, the Democrat Party lost nearly 6,000 registered voters, while the Republican Party picked up 146,000. And in the Bay Area, a bit of that stream is Asians. The Democrat Party, particularly in San Francisco, is a party focused on victims. And the, the, the Chinese community and the Asian, the Asian community in general, they don't want to be victims. They want to achieve the American dream. Dennis says violence against the Asian community has some Democratic voters looking for other options. And we have been lucky to have been able to have fielded a number of Asian Americans uh, on the ballot. And that's been really important, I think, in terms of growing our, our party. When I started my campaign, they said you can't, as a Republican, win any office here, period. So you can just forget it. That's the advice Min Chang got as a Republican running for a San Francisco school board seat, a nonpartisan position. People don't come up to me and say, Min, are you a Republican, Democrat or something else? They just want to know, do you understand the issues, right? Are you credible? Do you have experience? You know how to solve it? That's what people really care about. It's clearly anything but an easy road for the GOP in this portion of the Golden State, where in all but one of the nine Bay Area counties, even voters with no party preference outnumber Republicans. But while still proudly traditional, Eva Zhao says her community is now taking a fresh look at who deserves their vote. 
Now we, we have family, we have children, we have a house, and then we have a career. Now we're, we're moving towards the Republican. So most people, Blake, obviously just think of California as a big blue state, and it is. But when you get on the ground here, there are some interesting storylines, uh, like with the Asian community. Blake. Brian Anton, coast to coast for us, live tonight in California. Brian, awesome reporting. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Don't miss Brian's next stop on the road trip. Driving the vote continues tomorrow, 6 o'clock Eastern, right here on the Hill. All right, joining me now, Jonathan Cobb, former senior advisor to the West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, Roma Duravi, former Trump administration deputy director of strategic communications. Hello to you both. Thanks for being here. Um, your old boss's seat, gone, gone. in the Senate. Is, is the, we were just talking about the, the House, is the likely scenario that this is runaway for Republicans? No, I think a few months ago it was the likely scenario, but I think a lot of these races have, cl- have uh, sort of gotten a lot closer. Most of them are tied. I think a lot of them will depend on who wins the presidential at the top of the ticket in Pennsylvania. Um, so there's a correlation Michigan. there. Yeah, I think there will be a correlation. Also, Colin Allred has come out of nowhere and is basically tied with Ted Cruz. And if I were Ted Cruz, I would be really worried if you've been a you senator. Think that's legit? If you've been a senator there for that long and you're tied at this point and the uh, Mitch McConnell super PAC is having to throw mm-hmm. money in, I would be a little worried. And Tom, uh, not Tom Osborne, they found another Osborne right. <laughs> right. in Nebraska. The new, the new famous Osborne right. in Nebraska. And we, in have, we have no idea right. who he'll caucus with, but he will probably be the only freshman ever to have four Super A committees. I just showed you the DDHQ numbers that basically show coin flip in, in the House. Mm-hmm. What happens if Democrats win? I mean, you only have a few races here or there, and then you possibly get gridlock here in Washington, no matter who's the president. Well, you could say it's gridlock no matter if it's split or if they have, you know, all three, right? Because in uh, when Biden and Harris first got here, they had the House, the White House, the House, White House, and the Senate. Still, you didn't see them passing any major reform in regards to what their biggest issue is, abortion on the ticket. So you have to ask yourself, how big of a shift is it really going to make in terms of the legislation that gets passed or doesn't get passed? What we do know is that President Trump has never been one to sit around and wait to see if the members on the Hill are going to act. He is going to take action immediately with executive orders. I don't know that we'll see the same sort of moves from Kamala Harris, even though we, they have to, had to make some of those shifts in regards to immigration lately. Right. But it just doesn't seem like something that she's willing to do. Her entire message over the last couple of weeks has been, we need action from Congress on immigration. So what happens, like you said, if, there's if she's there and, that, and it and that goes that goes for both sides. Yeah. Both of you two stay here coming up. Uh, have you seen what Donald Trump just did out on the campaign trail? We're going to show you the images of what is happening right now. I'm Blake Berman. Thanks for being with us here on The Hill. Full panel, other side of the break. That, that I know, or Puerto Rico, where I'm in my home state of Delaware, they're good, decent, honorable people. The only garbage I see floating out there is his supporters. His, his, his demonization of seen as unconscionable, and it's un-American. President Biden last night seemingly suggesting that Donald Trump's supporters, as you heard there, are garbage. The White House today trying to make the argument that Biden didn't say that at all. The president getting into the mix after a Trump-supporting comedian called Puerto Rico garbage. So after days of questions about Trump and his event, the spotlight shifted to what many believe is the current leader of the Democratic Party, demonizing half the country. Now, this is something that Jamie Dimon, the CEO of the country's biggest bank, warned about earlier this year. Watch. I wish the Democrats would think a little more carefully when they talk about MAGA. When people say MAGA, they're actually looking at people voting for Trump, and they think they're voting, and they're basically scapegoating them, that you are like him. Uh, and, but I don't think they're voting for Trump because of his family values. And if you look, just take a step back, be honest. He was kind of right about NATO, kind of right about immigration. Mm-hmm. He grew the economy quite well. China, Trade, China ta- virus. Tax reform worked. Yeah. He was right about some of China. I don't, th- I don't like no, what he did. No, I said China virus. Yeah, I understand. When he, when he may have been right. He, he, and I don't like how he said things about I Mexico. I don't like... But he wasn't wrong about some of these critical issues. And that's why they're voting for him. Now, if Trump wins, we might ask the question, was that analysis from January spot on? 
But what about the other side of the aisle? What about Harris? What happens if she comes out on top? Could it be because of what the Hawaii governor, Josh Green, told us here on the Hill, right from the Democratic National Convention? Kamala is very likely to win this election, and I will tell you why. There's why? 65 million women of reproductive age who are pissed that their, their rights are being taken away from them. There's going to be a, a female surge. Full panel with me now here on the Hill, Kelly Meyer, News Nation Washington correspondent, Chris Steyerwald, host of The Hill Sunday, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, Roma Duravi, former Trump administration, Jonathan Cott, former senior advisor to Joe Manchin. All right, so I, when you look, listen to those two sound bites, right, like we're at the part right now where both sides are slinging mud mm-hmm. at each other. And we, we ask next week, Chris, oh, Trump won because of this, mm-hmm. or Harris won because of that. Is it going to come down to what I just played you there, what Jamie Dimon said about Trump if he wins, or what... Um, Josh Green said about Harris if she wins. If Jamie Dimon knew as much about politics <laughs> as he knows about money and markets, he wouldn't have said that. Because the reason that people are voting for Donald Trump, the overwhelming reason that people are voting for Donald Trump is that he's not a Democrat and he's not Kamala Harris. The overwhelming number of people who are voting for Kamala Harris are not voting for her because of her. They're voting for her because they're voting against Donald Trump. We're going to see another election. Will it be two-thirds of all voters are voting against more than they're voting for? Hmm. But the majority of voters will be voting to prevent something that they think is bad from happening, not voting affirmatively for something. Now, Donald Trump has a big advantage in this election, which is that for a core group of his supporters, they're fanatical. They love him. It's a religious, ecstatic experience for Donald Trump. Kamala Harris doesn't have anything like that. But she does have something on the other side, which is her core supporters hate Donald Trump like God hates sin. They will march out to vote against him, and that's what she was saying out on the mall last night. So none of those issues, it doesn't come down to, to any of that stuff? No. It comes down to whether we can have a turnout, whether women get out to vote, which they did in... 2022, 2023, we've seen them overperform in every poll, and that's what I'm expecting will happen in 2024. They're angry. So you think Josh Green's right? Yes, I think Josh Green is right. If Jamie Dimon knew anything about politics, he would have run for president. One of the many (laughs) times he floated the idea, he's got a billion dollars to just throw out there at any point. So what about he can hire you, though? (laughs) Oh, he can definitely (laughs) hire me. So what, what about that idea? What about that idea, though, Roma? Of Trump is right. Stop demonizing. Trump was right. Uh, it's about the issue, stop demonizing MAGA. Well, they're never going to stop demonizing his supporters because it riles up their base, and that's who they're talking to right now. I I don't think that the Democrats are really paying enough attention to the people in the margins, and that's where this race is going to be won. You have Trump, on the other hand, who's spending time not just in red areas but in blue cities as well. That shows a a complete opposite of the narrative coming from the left, that he cares more than just about himself. He cares about the people down ballot from him because he knows if and when he wins— He needs to have their help on the Hill to get things done. Uh, I don't know that Donald Trump has ever shown that he cares a lot about anybody but Donald Trump. And I would point out that... That's not fair. You can't make a blanket comment like that. I I have watched him for a long time growing up in New York. Donald Trump seems to care mostly about himself. I'd also point out as the rally... Does that argument win, though, at the end of the day? Like, that's Kamala Harris's argument down the stretch, in part. Yes, he cares more about himself. She cares more about people. He goes out there and gives long speeches about grievances. But let's remember, that rally, the Puerto Rico comment was one of, like, ten that were horribly offensive and racist. This is the one that's gotten the most attention. You cannot possibly try to say that President Trump is going to lean on a comedian's statements for his policies. That's what the left is doing with this comment right now. So speaking speaking of the comment, speaking of the comment, Kelly Meyer, are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. (laughs) Roll it. (laughs) 250 million, the real number. They don't think in terms of garbage, okay? They don't use terms like that, and it's a shame. All right, so that was Donald Trump, Kelly, moments ago, quite literally, in a garbage truck. Show, show the, keep the images up if we can. Uh, trying to capitalize on what President Biden said last night in the White House trying to clean it up. So the Trump campaign obviously trying to keep this in the headlines, trying to keep this in the focus. He says this is for Joe and Kamala. So he's trying to keep this new cycle off of him and on the former president and Kamala Harris, his opponent, in six days. But at the same time, it could also draw attention back to the comments from Sunday where the comedian said Puerto Rico is a a floating pile of garbage. Um, 
Just a reminder, Puerto Rico can't not vote in the general, but they do have, what, nearly 6 million Puerto Ricans uh, living in the mainland that can. So, Chris, this is six days to go. Yeah. Some of the the back and forth that we're going to get. One of the conversations I had with you today is sort of how I want to end this, which is what I said. Steyerwald, are there really any persuadables left? Like, if, if, if a comedian says that... Or if, if Biden says this and Trump tries to jump on it, are there really any persuadables left at this point in time? So events could matter. Uh, we talk about Anthony Weiner's laptop. We talk the, uh, an event is something that changes the thing. But this is these are events about events. This, hmm. These are pseudo events. These are talking about what other people said. This isn't going to break through. It may motivate some people. As Kelly says, there's a boomerang effect. This motivates right. that, but then it motivates back to the other thing. Who knows? What I love about where we are now in this weird space is we don't have to listen to spin anymore. Yep. We we have now crossed over. We're crossing the rainbow bridge into the post-spin area where we now get to see what the results were going to be, and we can we can pick remember, up spin again next week. Remember what I said to you this morning in a text? What's that? My goalposts are news and numbers, and That's everything right. should stick right, right in between right. there right. with right. a week to go. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Other side of the break, Leland Vitter, host of On Balance, joins me live as uh, Donald Trump, set to be... <laughs> Set to be in Wisconsin tonight. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, On the right side of your screen, Kamala Harris live there as well. Brett Favre coming out on the trail. Leland, other side of the break. All right, welcome back here to the Hill. Leland Vittert, feels like same time, same place. Here we are at 7 o'clock basically on the East Coast. It's me, you, split screen, and two, two rallies going on right now. The next six days. Um, you know, in yeah. terms of bingo cards for 2024... Donald Trump in a garbage truck was not on my bingo card. (laughs) I mean, look, here we are. You know, Joe Biden stepped on Kamala Harris last night, big time. It was a reminder of why he's no longer the Democratic nominee for president. And she is. And whatever you think about it, Donald Trump's out there in a garbage truck today, six days left to go. This is who he is and what he does. A reminder of uh, number one rule in politics, when your Hmm. opponent's having a bad week, don't get in the way. 